Right, yes, thank you. Um, so, as Stefan has said, I will be talking about a project we've been building internally and will soon be releasing once everything is fully documented. Um, so, uh, this is talking about our GDB server. Now, uh, the reason we need a GDB server for real hardware is because when you're writing software for your bare metal system, you obviously need to be able to, to run it to see if things are working. Um, there are various GDB servers around. There's one built into OpenOCD, but it's not particularly good. It's always getting better, but it's not that great. Um, especially these days, we want something that more flexibly supports uh, various models of real hardware. So hardware these days is very multi-core. It could even be multi-architecture. Uh, you want to be able to support multiple debuggers because you don't know what your users are going to be using. Um, and you need a debug server that can handle all that. Uh, in addition, uh, well, as I say, um, when you're writing software, you want to be able to run it on real hardware. That hardware may not exist, so you want to be able to run it into a simulator. Uh, this is useful for us, particularly at Embercosm, because working on compilers, we want to make sure that when someone writes C, the assembly we generate is actually correct. Um, and as it turns out, uh, this is, turns out to be useful for hardware testing too. Uh, we've had cases for some of our customers in the past where we are running GDB tests into a piece of into a simulated piece of hardware and tests fail. Um, this can either be there's a bug in, our, in, the, in the compiler we've written or there's a bug in hardware. And we've had cases where for some customers it turns out that it actually was hardware bugs. And if you're doing this sufficiently early in your flow and you haven't taped anything out, you can fix those bugs before you go through the expensive task of taping stuff out. Um, so a little bit about internally how uh, debuggers actually talk to hardware. Now, GDB and LODB use this protocol called Remote Serial Protocol. So you're probably familiar with uh, typing into GDB, target remote, and then some port number. And when you do that, GDB will send a bunch of packets to a server uh, of this sort of form. So G here is tell me the contents of all your registers, and the server will respond all of that back. Uh, there's a roughly one-to-one -one mapping of commands to simple stuff. So like print, print foo. Uh, will turn into give me the contents address at hex, say, 124, give me two bytes, and the server will respond with that. Um, so we've built a server that abstracts all of these packets to a simple-to-implement interface uh, that, again, roughly maps one-to-one -one with each GDB packet. So as an example, we have... So this is like your basic your basic implementation of this server. Um, we have some things that aren't necessarily mapped to what GDB expects, but is useful for things like uh, performance measuring. So we have built-in get cycle count, get instruction count, um, and then things like give me contents of registers, write the contents of registers, uh, read and write memory, uh, start various calls, stop various calls, get the state of uh, what's just running, and various interfaces like that. Um, and because this interface is particularly simple uh, and sort of a nice clean abstraction, we can build various things on top of this. So for instance, one thing that we've done for one of our uh, customers with a former version of this tool is build a what we call a uh, lockstep debug target, where going back to this searching for hardware bugs problem, if we have a target that just exposes two more targets, you can duplicate every uh, command that you send and verify that both things are doing the same. Uh, in this case, if um, so, say in this case, if the 
to if your emulated hardware, so say your Verilator model and some other simulator disagrees on what the contents of a register is, the debugger will immediately halt at that instruction and say, hang on, something's not right here. Here is the current state of the machine. And then you can, well, go into more hardware debugging, see what, try and work out what's going on. Um, one other thing that we're also looking at, we don't yet have this implemented, is looking at debugging multiple architectures at once. Now, in GDB, this is a bit hard because GDB expects all cores on a system to be the same architecture, but that doesn't stop us running multiple GDBs. So in this case, our server will talk to your system on chip um, and expose two different uh, GDB server ports so that you can say debug a RISC-V core and an ARM core at the same time, when you, you can set, um, so the idea is you can set breakpoints on either, set everything going, and then if a breakpoint triggers on one half of the system, the second half of the system will also stop. Um, so uh, I would now like to demonstrate the former of this working, should everything work. Um, so. So uh, I have, because we only have very good working cores here, I would like to uh, sorry, present a slightly buggy core that I call riskier, which is risky, but X31 has an unfortunate bug where bit zero is hardwired to zero, which is really annoying. I'd really like my cores to work. Um, and as it happens, I have a piece of software that happens to write the value 5 to x31, which is going to expose this bug quite nicely. So if I start my, my GDB server, I, you can see throughout all of the spammy log that I am running my lockstep target. On the left, I'm running risky, and on the right, I'm running riskier. And now, if I load my program into the core uh, and start debugging, this demonstrates how we would like the oh, wrong command. So at the moment, I am stopped just before loading 5 into a register to copy it into X31. And as if I print all the registers, if I spell register correctly, so, well, it's sort of a basic setup machine where at the moment we can see that X31 just contains 0. Um, but if I step through the program a couple of times, um, unfortunately, it's a bit hard to see here. We can see on the, on the right, the server is complaining that the side effects of running this previous step do not match. Something different happened in both cores. Um, and we report that to, well, you see printed here, divergence detected executing the last that says instruction, it's just fallen off the side of the screen. Uh, and if I try to print the registers again, because I happen to know where, what the problem is, I can now see that while in my general purpose registers, X31 has now disappeared because I have, I have no concrete value. I don't know which is correct. I can now see that X31 on the left-hand side is five and X31 on the right is four. And from that, I can then do what needs do what needs to be done to try and evaluate why something is wrong in my system. Um, so what we have so far is a working risky target. Uh, Jeremy has been porting Pico RV32 to also be debuggable and then we can start running the same programs into both and see if, if they diverge in any way. 
Um, Craig Blackmore is working on an open OCD target, so then we can debug real hardware. And we are regularly testing this on various targets on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. So regardless of what host operating system people want to run, we're sure that this will work. Uh, in the future, um, I want to improve the uh, debuggability when things go wrong between um, various debuggers. Because at the moment, you see different things depending on which debugger you use. Uh, in particular, at the moment, GDB does not understand my left and right registers, and it needs to be taught to understand that a bit better. Um, we need to implement some more GDB internal stuff um, so that we can get this heterogeneous system on chip target working. Uh, we need to work on a lot of documentation because there is no point releasing this thing into the world if it's undocumented and no one knows how to use it. So. That, for me, is a very hard barrier to actually releasing this. And then just targeting it to more things to sort of prove it works. Uh, in particular, I hear there are other architectures in RISC-V, so it would be good to port some of those as well. Um, and then switch our, we have a public um, GCC toolchain testing farm for um, testing in particular RISC-V toolchain, so it would be nice to switch that to this to continuously feed in and find more bugs. Um, and that is everything that I have to say and show today. Does anyone have any questions? Well, this looks like a lot of fun. I, I'm Really encouraged by uh, seeing what you've done. I did have a question, though, back on uh, where you said you were going to compare Pico RV and the RISCI uh, cores against each other. Now, I understand that just because they're both RISC-V cores, they're identical. But actually, the, uh, the cycle time between the instructions uh, is very different between the two. How do you reconcile um, one core, the, the Pico RV, which is a sort of a one instruction at a time core versus the RISCI, which is a pipelined CPU. So in the design of the thing that does the comparisons, to some extent we've sort of defined this as if you're implementing targets, this is your problem. All the server cares about is I have something that implements this class that has to be comparable and you just throw whatever, because I, I don't want to def like hard code into this system what side effects are. But what I'm think the route I'm thinking down is, I only care about instruction retirement, so. And while I haven't looked at this, I'm not sure if things like the RISC-V formal interface might help with this. I'm not quite sure, but. It could. That's sort of the route I'm thinking down. Um, but I suspect a lot of this will probably fall out of when we actually run this and go, oh, yes. <laughs> so the big uh, ch challenge you'll have with the RISC-V formal interface is that in order to get RISCI working, I had to retire at times two instructions on the same clock. Okay. Enjoy that. Hello. Um, so... You showed comparing two cores. Is it just as easy to compare a golden reference simulator? Yes, it's just it, all, all this like comparison thing does is anything that implements that interface I had a few slides ago. Oh. Um, all this lockstep target does is load two more shared objects with that interface and check the return results of all the cores. Uh, which is the same way that we're doing testing of all the internals. Okay, now that makes sense. I, I didn't think about that when I saw this. Possibly with the future of nesting these things into some massive tree of let's test 64 implementations. Well, may, maybe. So, um, if uh, um, a bit of like uh, these arrows. So if you made this on an FPGA, like which part would you implement where? Would you run this embedded debug server on your FPGA or on the host? No, the, 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 thing, the debug server will run on your, your desktop and you will take what, however you communicate with the thing you're debugging and stick it behind that interface. So 
like in in like the future plans, one of these blocks will be like there's an open OCD block which just communicates. I guess Olaf. So this, uh, I've been thinking about implementing the Risk Five debug spec, but this looks like. Almost the same thing, but a very small subset. Uh, would this be, would this be usable? This interface would it be usable for runtime control, like a light version of the debug spec? Uh, the debug specs for is I'm trying to remember is what exists in the hardware, right? Yeah. So you would have. So if you had that in your hardware, you would write some mapper that maps between these hooks and well however you okay so let's thank the speaker again